Okay, our next speaker is becoming a Hillsdale regular. We're glad he could be with us again. Uh, John Goodman is president of the Goodman Institute for Public Policy Research. He received his PhD in economics from Columbia University, and uh, Dr. Goodman previously served for many years as the president of the National Center for Policy Analysis. Uh, he's taught at several colleges and universities, including the University of Dallas, and is a recipient of the Duncan Black Award for his work on public choice economics. Uh, he testifies frequently before Congress on the topic of health care reform. He's on radio and television all the time. Uh, he writes in, in many, uh, for many periodicals, Investors Business Daily, USA Today, and Forbes, uh, among many others. Uh, he's the author of numerous studies on health policy and many books, including the best-selling uh, book, Patient Power, Solving America's Health Care Crisis. So he's well qualified to be one of the, um, the leaders uh, in the effort today to repeal and replace uh, the Affordable Care Act. Today he's going to offer us some thoughts on that subject. He, the title of his presentation is Obamacare and its Alternatives. Please welcome John Goodman. Wow. <laughs> After an introduction like that, it makes you feel like you should run for office. Uh, I'm, I'm John Goodman. I approve that message. Actually, I thought our uh, staff was being a little bit generous when we suggested some of those remarks, Tim, but I enjoyed hearing every word of it. Now, on my way up here, somebody said, uh, be sure that your cell phone is turned off. And I said, well, why would I want to do that? I mean, you can have an emergency right in the middle of a speech, right? No, actually, the reason I have my phone with me, and it is turned off, by the way, uh, is to illustrate a point. There are more cell phones in the United States than there are people. Even the panhandler out there on the street corner probably has a cell phone, but he probably doesn't have very good access to health care. If something goes wrong with my cell phone in Dallas, Texas, there are a dozen places I can step into without an appointment and get pretty speedy repairs, high quality, low cost. There are some places that will even send a repair person to my condo, repair my iPhone in my home. Or there's a national chain that's called iHospital. People who work for it are called eye doctors. And yet, if something happens to me, um, did you know that the average wait in the United States to see a new doctor is three weeks? In Boston, where we were told they had universal coverage even before there was Obamacare, the average wait to see a new doctor is two months. And amazingly, one out of every ten people that goes to, who go to an emergency room for care turn around and leave without ever seeing a doctor just because they get tired of waiting. In some places, it's one in five, which is about what it is in Canada. Now, my question to you is, why is the market so kind to my phone, so mean to me? And I think the answer is that this iPhone is produced and repaired in a real market with real prices where entrepreneurs know if they solve our problems, they can make millions of dollars. Whereas over in healthcare, we have so suppressed the market year after year, decade after decade, that no one ever sees a real price for anything. No patient, no doctor, no employer, no employee. We like to think that our system's really different from the Canadian system, but the truth of the matter is it's about 80% the same. In both countries, the primary way we pay for health care is with time and not with money. In Canada, if you go to the doctor, it's free. In the United States, if you go to the doctor, it's almost free. Every time we spend a dollar at a doctor's office, only 10 cents is coming out of our own pocket. The other 90 cents is paid for by a third party payer, an employer, an insurance company, or, or the government. Have you ever noticed that when you visit another professional, a lawyer, an accountant, an engineer, architect, when you, when you go to their office, uh, that exterior area is called a reception area, right? But when you go to the doctor's office, what do you call it? A waiting room. <laughs> There's a reason for that. <laughs> Now, we've bought into the same notion that all the other developed countries have bought into, and that is that people should never have to choose between money, uh, between health care and other uses of money. And what we forget is that when we suppress the marketplace, when we suppress real prices, what we do is we elevate the importance of all the non-market barriers to care. Now, what are non-market barriers to care? Well, how long does it take you on the telephone to make an appointment with a doctor? How many days or weeks do you have to wait until you see the doctor? 
How long does it take you to get from your home or your office to the doctor's office and back? And while you're there, how long do you have to wait before you're actually treated? These are non-market barriers to care, and there's a lot of evidence, which we could talk about, that these non-market barriers are a bigger obstacle to care than the fee that the doctor actually charges. And that's not just for the middle class, it's also for low-income people. There are in the United States about 50 million people who are on food stamps. And people who have food stamps can walk into any supermarket you and I can walk into. They can buy just about any product that we buy. They're paying the same price that we pay. When they get to the checkout counter, in the old days they put the food stamps down, put dollar bills on top of it. These days they have a card. But the main point is that uh, you never hear it said that low-income people do not have access to supermarkets in the United States. I mean, the worst that can happen is they have to get on a bus and go a couple of miles. But you never hear of a supermarket saying, we aren't taking any more food stamp customers, right? But over in healthcare, there are about 65 million people now on Medicaid, and mainly they're the same people. And on Medicaid, what is the biggest problem people have? It's finding a doctor who will see them. I was in Massachusetts not long ago, and I had a female cab driver, and she told me she was on MassHealth, which is Massachusetts Medicaid. And I said, well, how's it going? She said, well, she had to go down a list of 20 doctors before she found one who would see her. And I said, well, you're going down the yellow pages? And she said, no, no, I'm going down the list that MassHealth gave me. That's what they call universal coverage in the state of Massachusetts. Now, when the Medicaid patients uh, can't find a doctor, and by the way, it's not just Medicaid. I was reading the paper this morning that a lot of the patients who get private insurance and the Obamacare exchanges are having the same problem because they have really high deductibles, which they can't afford, so they go for free care at the community health centers and at the safety net hospitals, their emergency rooms. By the way, emergency room traffic is up since we got Obamacare. It's not down. So we're 20 million people with additional insurance, but more people going to the emergency room. Now, while that's happening, um, by the way, in, in my city, um, Parkland Hospital is our major safety net hospital. And if you walk into Parkland Hospital, if you're not bleeding all over the floor, it would not be unusual for you to wait four, five, or six hours before you're seen, uh, depending on the day of the week and, and the time of the day. Uh, that's what rationing by rating, waiting really means for low-income folks. Now, while all that's going on, we have in the United States today 2,000 walk-in clinics, and in the CVS pharmacies, they're called Minute Clinics. And the reason for that name, Minute Clinic, is because they want to convey to you that they know your time is valuable as well as your money. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that the Minute Clinic quality is actually greater. Uh, they, they follow best practices better than traditional primary care physicians for those uh, 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 problems that they're qualified to deal with. These are nurses following computerized protocol. Now, um, we have low-cost medicine, we have available medicine, but the problem is in Dallas, Texas, where I live, the charge for the Minute Clinic for an ear ache or a sore throat would be about $75. And Medicaid pays about half that. And that would be about the same all over the country. <laughs> Medicaid pays too far below the Minute Clinic price for Minute Clinic to take the Medicaid patients, and so it doesn't. We could greatly expand access to health care in this country for low-income families by just allowing them to purchase health care the way they purchase food. Uh, and yet we don't do that, and not only do we not do it, it's not even seriously considered. If we want to solve our health care problems, we have to liberate the patient. And then the next thing we have to do is liberate the doctor. Doctors are the only professionals in our society who are not free to repackage and reprice the services that they offer to the market. Every other professional, the lawyers, the accountants, the architects, if demand changes, if technology changes, if anything changes, uh, they can change what they offer, they can change the price, doctors cannot. They're slaves to a third party payer system. Now I wonder if any of you have ever noticed that um, Doctors don't like to talk to you on the phone. Have you ever noticed that? Um, I, it must have been a hundred years since all the other professionals discovered the phone. It's a really handy device for talking to clients. So. But, um, but not doctors. Do any of you know why that is? 
Who said they don't get paid? Yes, you're absolutely right. Now, why is that? Well, Medicare has um, about 7,500 tasks that it pays doctors to do. It's the worst way to pay any professional, but 7,500 things they pay doctors to do. Next to each one of them, there's a price. And when somebody drew up the list, they just forgot the phone. <laughs> this is one really, <laughs> one example of why it's so, so dumb to pay professionals in this way. All right, so we get to the end of the 20th century and everybody discovers email. So even my corner liquor store started emailing me if, see if they have a bottle of wine that uh, I might like. Um, by the way, the men clinic emails me. You know, once fall, they say, you know, your children uh, are going back to school, they need this or that. And, or it's flu season, uh, but my doctor doesn't email me. Why is that? You know, you were so good last time. This, is, this, this pop quiz is easy because you, you just keep repeating that answer, you're going to get an A here. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I noticed that um, uh, a number of you here in the medical profession, you either are or have been, uh, does the name Jeffrey Bren Brenner ring a bell with anybody? The, how about the term hot spots? Um, Brenner lives in Camden, New Jersey, and I'm told that this is one of the poorest places in the whole United States. Um, he's a scientist, he's a doctor, he's trying to understand what's going on there. He goes down the hospital records and he discovers that 1% of all the people living in Camden are responsible for 30% of all the hospital spending in a given year. So he starts looking at the 1% and he discovers this one guy who weighs more than 600 pounds. And this guy is an alcoholic, he's a drug addict, he's a diabetic. Uh, he spends half the year in the hospital, and the rest of the year he's abusing himself. So Brenner takes this guy under his arm, and he um, gets him off drugs, gets him off alcohol, gets him going to AA. He discovers the guy's a Christian, he gets him going to church. Um, he signs him up for some welfare so he can have some financial stability in his life. And pretty soon, the guy isn't going in the hospital anymore. So this, this, this once a very, very expensive patient, it turns out that his expenses are going down, 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 and saving tens of thousands of dollars. Now, Brenner um, discovered that, you know, that, that, that this is such a uh, wonderful discovery for him. He set up a clinic and got some money, and he has other doctors helping him. And now they have lots and lots of uh, patients that they're caring for in this way. In fact, Brenner told me he can drive down the streets of Camden and point to whole buildings and tell you how much the whole building is costing you as taxpayers uh, through Medicare or Medicaid. And that's where the term hot spots kind of came from. He discovered that sick people live near each other. I, I never quite understood that, but in any event, they do. So my question to you, though, is this. Here is Brenner now today saving you as taxpayers probably millions of dollars doing what he does. And in return for all that, how much do you think that Medicare gives Brenner? Somebody said nothing. Spot on. And how about Medicaid? How much do you think Medicaid gives him back? Nothing. And so now the question is, well, why is that? And the answer is because what I just described to you a moment ago um, is not, according to Medicare, real health care. Um, in fact, you might call it uh, social work. I mean, just getting people to clean up their act, uh, get off drugs, get off alcohol, uh, do some sensible things. All of a sudden, their health care costs are going down. Their health gets better. But that's not on the list of the 7,500 things that Medicare pays for. Now, back when the Bush people were in office, I went and told them about this. And uh, I said, you know what you guys should do? You, uh, you should give uh, Brenner a million dollars. And they, there was stunned silence. And then somebody said, well, why would we want to do that? I mean, he's already doing what we want him to do. See, this is the way bureaucrats think. <laughs> All of you are entrepreneurs. I know you don't, wouldn't think that way. So I patiently explained, you know, because if, if doctors throughout America learned that they could be paid a different way, you know, all they have to do is come to, to Washington and say, pay me a different way and I'll save you money. I'll raise quality. Uh, we, ought to, we ought to take the deal. Well, that was the most radical idea they had ever heard of, and of course they hadn't heard of Obamacare yet. Um, that, that was just around the corner. Um, if we want to reform our healthcare system, we have to free the patient, we have to free the doctor, and we have to free the entrepreneur. You know, um, 
There was a man and his wife, they went to a doctor. And he was in really, really bad shape. And his arteries were clogged and his heart was in poor shape. And the doctor called the wife over and said, uh, you know, your husband is in bad shape. And um, what you need to do is make his life as comfortable as possible. So don't nag at him, don't fuss at him, don't argue with him. Whatever he wants to eat, fix it for him. If he wants sex, give him sex. Just make his life as comfortable and pleasant as you can. So on the way home, the man turns to his wife and says, you know, you and the doctor had quite a long conversation. What did he say to you? He said, you're going to die. <laughs> I'm sometimes asked if the free market can work in health care, and my response is free, the free market is the only thing that works in health care. Uh, show me a health care sector where there's no Blue Cross, no Medicare, no employer, and we're probably looking at a healthcare market that works pretty well. Uh, just looking around the room, I'm gonna guess that um, most of you don't know very much about the market for cosmetic surgery. But, <laughs> but just give it another 10 years and even you will be interested. <laughs> All right, here's a market where there's no Blue Cross, there's no third party payer. And what do you get? You get package prices, you know, price covering everything, the doctor, the nurse, the anesthetist, the facility. Uh, you have price competition. And over the last 15 years, the real price of cosmetic surgery has gone down, 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 uh, even as the real price of every other kind of surgery has gone up, up, up. And, um, and this is with huge increase in demand, huge technological change of the type we're told increases costs everywhere else. Um, LASIK surgery, same thing, you get package prices, you have price competition, you have quality competition. Over the last 10, 15 years, 25% decrease in the real price of this procedure. Uh, here's another market that seems to work very, very well. Uh, we've already mentioned the walk-in clinics. Uh, Rx.com came into existence in order to compete with local pharmacies. Uh, their error rate is lower, uh, their prices are cheaper. Uh, every one of these examples I'm talking about came into existence in order to cater to people paying out of pocket with their own money. They may now take some insurance, uh, but they wouldn't exist if their only customer was Blue Cross. Uh, they exist and they do what they do to cater to real people paying with real money out of their own pockets. Uh, medical tourism down in Grand Cayman, just a plane ride away, you can get surgery that's really higher quality than what you'd expect in the United States. And by that I mean um, uh, lower infection rate, lower readmission rate, lower mortality rate, uh, and one third of the cost. All you have to do is get on a plane and go there. Um, what are they doing? They're doing the same thing that happened in these other examples I just gave you, and that is they're competing for people spending with their own dollars. Um, if we want the healthcare system to work, we need to get government out of the way. We need to reduce the role of the third party payers. We need to empower patients as much as possible and let the market work. And that's what Obamacare is not doing. Now I'm helping Pete Sessions in the House. He's on the Rules Committee, head of the chairman of the Rules Committee and part of the House leadership. And Bill Cassidy in the Senate, who probably knows more about health care than anybody in the Senate. And we're putting together an alternative to Obamacare. It's taken six years to get this done. Not that I've been working on it for six years, but for six years, Republicans have, have not produced a credible alternative. And none of our three Republican candidates have a credible alternative either, uh, nor does Bernie Sanders for that matter. Um, now I've got a list of 25 problems of Obamacare and we're gonna solve every single one of them, uh, but I won't go through all 25 with you right now, but let me just mention four really biggie, big ones. Number one, Obamacare uh, forces you to buy an insurance package designed in Washington and the cost of that package is going to grow twice as fast as your income. Um, now Obama didn't create the fundamental problem nor did Congress. It's been going on for 40 years. For 40 years the real cost of health care per person in this country has been growing at about twice the rate of our income and you don't have to be a mathematician or an accountant to know that if that continues, eventually healthcare crowds out everything else we're consuming. And as a matter of fact, if we continue on the path that we're on, uh, by the time today's college students get to their retirement age, um, 
there won't be anything else left. <laughs> there, they won't have any money for food or clothing or housing, but they have really great health care. Um, clearly, that's an impossible outcome. Um, and yet, that's what Obamacare does. And here is something that I haven't seen anybody else comment on except me. And that is there are these secret little provisions in the Obamacare bill that protect the government from all this. And what are they? Well, the, in Medicare, uh, there's a provision that says that Medicare going forward is supposed to grow no faster than our income <laughs> forever. So when Obama says he's really helped Medicare, yes, he's helped it in the sense that, 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 that there may be seniors who don't get the care they need because they're going to limit the spending. And then Medicaid hospital spending is also going forward past uh, the next few years forever, going to grow no faster than national income. And finally, after 2018, the government subsidies and the exchanges, the subsidies that we know help people buy private insurance, they are going to grow no faster than national income. So if I can do a visual for you, health care costs are going to go like this, the government's contribution to them are going to go like this, and they're going to be shifting more and more costs to the private sector. That clearly is a problem that can't go on, needs solving. Now, number two, we have this bizarre system of subsidies. Uh, in most places, a family at 138% of poverty can go into Medicaid, most states, and a family of four gets insurance that I'm going to say is worth about $8,000. If this family earns one more dollar, then um, they get kicked out of Medicaid. They go into the exchange, and let's say now they have a plan that's worth about $12,000, they have to pay about eight or nine hundred dollars out of their own pocket for it. Um, so back on Medicaid, let's say they were getting an eight thousand dollar gift. In the Obamacare exchange, they get an eleven thousand dollar gift. But the employees of this hotel, I don't know if you've noticed as you walk around and look around, and most of these people are only making fifteen, twenty dollars an hour, if that. Uh, you know, the maids, the busboys, and so forth. Um, they're at the same income level. And Obamacare legislation is trying to force these employees in this hotel to buy expensive health insurance, and they get no new help from government. Uh, so we have an $8,000 gift, um, $11,000 gift. Over here at the hotel, if they don't do what they're told, they all get fined. Um, that's not fair, but um, there's something worse than it not being fair. It's going to upset our whole economy. Because as employers discover that everybody who's below average wages is really better off in the exchange or in Medicaid. And everybody who's above average wages is better off getting health insurance at work. And there's evidence that most people are ignoring that companies are really changing who they employ and how they form based on these health insurance subsidies. And that's bad. You know, if we want to have an economy that's... Um, vigorous and competitive and compete in the world economy. We need these decisions to be made on economic uh, costs and benefits, not on costs and benefits from health insurance subsidies by the government. Now, um, number three. We have in the exchanges a race to the bottom, what I call a race to the bottom, and all of you have heard uh, about some of the problems there. What I mean by race to the bottom is we have a bunch of insurers, and you know, you don't really have to be in the insurance market to understand this. Uh, if, if you imagine you're an insurance company and you have to take every enrollee that applies for your plan at the same premium, no matter how sick, no matter how well, uh, you won't have to think about that very long to realize that you have your best chance of making a profit on healthy people. And um, likely you will uh, suffer severe losses uh, if the enrollee is sick. So what all the plans are doing is they're trying to attract the healthy and avoid the sick. Now, the insurance guys uh, figured out a long time ago that healthy people tend to buy on price. And so how do you get the price down? Well, you have a high deductible. You have a narrow network. The way you get a narrow network is you throw out a really low fee and just take the doctors who will accept it. Take the facilities, the hospitals who will accept it. And those typically tend not to be the very best doctors or the best facilities. So narrow networks tend to leave out the best cancer doctors, the best cancer facilities. Where I live, it leave, leaves out uh, UT Southwestern Medical School, which is our premier health center in Dallas. And there's not one plan in the exchange in Dallas that covers UT Southwestern. 
So um, that's what we're getting, a race to the bottom. And it's like a game of mus musical chairs. Nobody wants the sick person. And by the way, the perverse incentives don't stop at the point of entry. You know, after you've entered the plan, uh, the perverse incentives are still there. Uh, if you're healthy, they want you. The incentives is to overspend on the healthy, to keep the ones they have and attract more of them next time around, um, and under provide to the sick because they don't want the ones they have, and they uh, certainly don't want to attract any more of them. And then problem number four, that, that, the problem I just described is on the seller side of the market. Uh, they're gaming the system. Then over on the buyer side of the market, there's a similar perverse incentive, and that is to wait until you get sick to buy health insurance. And this is happening a lot. And how do I know that? Because all the insurance companies are complaining about it. Uh, they say that people that wait until June and figure out some some excuse to get around the rules and buy insurance outside of open season, they're sicker than other patients. And furthermore, the sick people go in and they get their care and then they drop their coverage. You know, between January and September, we're losing a fourth of the people in the exchange. They just quit paying premiums. Now, in Massachusetts, these are called jumpers and dumpers. People jump in when they get sick, they get their medical care, they get their bills paid, and then they dump the plan after, um, after they get well again. But if we all do that, uh, what's going to happen? Uh, the only people with health insurance will be sick. And if the only people with health insurance will be sick, the premium is going to have to be really, really high for anyone to stay in the business. So we have um, potentially now a death spiral because of all of this. And what happens in a death spiral is your, your population just gets sicker and sicker. And as that happens, you have to keep raising your premiums higher and higher, and you go into what we would call in any other industry just bankruptcy. Uh, and there's severe danger of that. But even if we don't go all the way into a death spiral, we have truly dysfunctional system where everybody is facing perverse incentives. Um, you know, the Yakuza in Japan uh, have a practice, which I think is kind of interesting. If, if one of their members... Um, commits a serious mistake. You know, what he does, he severs a finger, and then he offers the finger uh, to his superior by way of atonement. And I've often thought, if the members of the Congress, the members of the Obama administration, <laughs> had as much honor as, as the members of the Japanese mafia, well, we'd have a lot less finger pointing in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what are we gonna do about it? Well, we have um, a bill. I said it hadn't been working for six years, but I had been working for a year on this and spent a long time with Legislative Council because we're doing a lot of new things that have never been done before. Uh, it's easy for Legislative Council if they can copy some previous bill that had a lot of the same language, but for us it was almost all new. And one of the things we're doing is we're replacing the, all the hodgepodge system we have now with just a uniform, universal tax credit, same for everyone. It's uh, beginning next year, it'll be $2,500 for an adult and $8,000 for a family of four. And that's your tax credit, and it's refundable, so even if you're not paying taxes, you still get it, provided that you pay premiums with it or make deposits to health savings accounts. And then we're going to get government out of the way. And so instead of telling people what they have to buy, we're going to let the market determine what it can do for the money that people have. And our minimum tax credit is sort of tied to Medicaid. In other words, most people with it would have no trouble buying a plan that looks like our best managed private Medicaid plans. It's not a plan that most of you would want to be in, but it's, um, uh, it, it's, it's the minimum benefit. It's what Democrats consider to be an acceptable level of care. So, we're, so we have a minimum that everybody is entitled to. There's no reason for anybody to be uninsured, but, um, but we solve a huge problem. And in the process, we're going to do something for employers that no one else has had the courage to do uh, because of John McCain's poor, uh, poor experience in the 2008 election. Uh, John McCain advocated a universal tax credit, and Barack Obama, or his campaign, demagogued the whole issue, uh, spent $100 million on commercials that claimed that McCain was going to tax everybody's insurance. And you can go on the Internet and see that commercial today, by the way. It's the most downloaded commercial that's ever been run in a political campaign. Um, 
Okay, with that problem in our background, um, even the Obamacare advisors prefer the tax credit approach, and that includes Zeke Emanuel, uh, who was the White House doctor who helped give us uh, Obamacare, Jason Furman, who's the chief economist for Obama. They all understand the tax credit approach is better, and let me just explain just briefly what this does for the employer and the employee. Um, currently, if we have a family plan that costs $20,000 under the current system, an employer and employer are buying it all with pre-tax dollars, every one of those dollars is getting a subsidy. And the subsidy is avoiding payroll and income taxes. And if you live in New York City and you have a decent income, uh, you're in the 50% tax bracket, which means that every single dollar you're spending on health insurance through your employer uh, is getting a 50% subsidy from the government. And that means that health insurance only has to be worth 50 cents to you to be preferable to a dollar of wages. Now what we're going to do is push the tax benefits up front. So the first $8,000 gets a dollar for dollar subsidy and the next 12 gets nothing. So for the average worker, this is just a wash because we're just taking money in the system and pushing it up front. But what it means is that um, it's only the first dollars of insurance, the core insurance that we want everybody to have, that's what we're going to subsidize. And all the marginal insurance, uh, which contains the benefits of questionable value, people do that with unsubsidized dollars. And what that means is if they find waste in their health plan, every dollar of waste can be converted to a dollar of take-home pay. You know, I was talking to Donald Trump's economist just the other day, and I said, your candidate doesn't have a decent health plan, nor do the other two, but here's an idea. Go with this tax credit approach, and I think you could credibly claim the average family would save $2,000. That's $2,000 added to take-home pay. You all are out there talking about incomes and how they stagnated and all this. Here's a practical proposal that gets support from the left and the right. It's a common sense approach to health care that would increase uh, family income. The other common sense proposal I made was uh, a corporate flat tax. A 9% uh, across the board uh, tax on corporate profits instead of what we have today. Uh, the best tax economists in the whole country that I work with say that would save about $3,000 for the average household. So there's, there's a $5,000 uh, benefit to blue-collar workers that we can credibly make. And it's not just some right-wing idea. It's not trickle-down economics. It, these are two proposals that have broad support, um, but so far I can't get through to them. Okay, then on the exchange, we're going to have real market for insurance where we have real risk adjustment, so the healthy are just as attractive to the insurers as the sick. We're gonna use the Medicare Advantage approach. How many of you are, are in Medicare Advantage? Any of you, or, or some of you? Um, when a Medicare enrollee goes into the American Medicare Advantage program, the government makes a risk adjusted payment to that plan. So if, 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 the, if the senior has a lot of health problems, that plan may get $60,000. Uh, and there are plans that specialize in special needs patients. And, um, uh, and they try to attract people with health problems because they get a lot of money for those patients. We're going to use that same risk adjustment mechanism in our new market for health insurance, but we're not going to have Medicare dictate everything. We're going to let the insurers improve on that risk adjustment system. We're going to get free market risk adjustment. And then on uh, gaming the system on the part of... Um, the buyers, and then I'm going to quit here in just a second and let you all ask questions because I understand that this is a group that likes to ask questions. Am I right about that? Okay. We figured out with seniors, we don't need mandates, right? If, if you're a senior, you can go into Medicare Part B. You can go to Medicare Part D. There's no mandate, right? It's guaranteed issue, community rated. Um, Medigap market, same thing. But if you don't sign up when you're eligible, then you get penalized. In the Medigap market, if you don't sign up when you're eligible, you can be underwritten, which means you can be charged a premium that reflects your expected costs. So we know how to solve these problems without oppressive mandates, and, uh, and that's what we're going to do in our new health bill. Now let me just wrap up and let you ask me a few questions by saying that I was introduced as the father of health savings accounts. Um, to most people, health savings accounts are a financial concept. 
they good, create good financial incentives for patients and they do all that. But for me, the most important um, aspect of the HSA is not the financial aspect. The most important aspect for me has always been the power aspect. Uh, the healthcare system can be cold, indifferent, uncaring, unresponsive, and probably all of you have experienced all of those things. And so it occurs to me, though, that if you control the money and you have the power to make decisions for yourself, that system is going to work better for you than if you surrender the money and the power to some impersonal bureaucracy. Thank you all very much. We have time for a few questions. Try to pick out the easy questions, will you? Well, since you seem so knowledgeable about Congress, here's an easy one for you. I don't see how this medical problem called Obamacare was a surprise to anyone. They had to see it coming. Why have the uh, both parties, let's start with the Republicans, sat in their duff for decades and done nothing about it? And now, after it's put in place, they hardly explain why it should be withdrawn, just they don't like it. Well, the main problem, it's actually with both parties, but the main problem with the Republican Party is that someone like me can go in and, and tell them how you can reform the system in a free enterprise way, minimize the role of government, streamline the role of government, and then after I leave their office, they'll call up the insurance company and say, what do you think of Goodman's plan? Well, we don't like that. And they call the hospitals, and, they, um, and they're too tied into all the special interests. And what we all need to understand is that reform means people have to change what they're doing. And most people don't want to change what they're doing, especially if they're in the insurance business, uh, but also in the hospital business and, and, and these other uh, areas. So we haven't had the kind of leaders. Uh, Paul Ryan is a, is a good person in this respect. He's the one who carried my bill a couple of years ago. So Paul and I go way, way back. And if there were more people like Paul, this would be easier. But, um, but they're all kowtowed by the special interests. Who, who contributed to their campaigns? Why do we all have to take Medicare? Why can't we have private choice so our physicians will accept our insurance? Because if Medicare doesn't pay their fee, then the coinsurance doesn't pay their fee. And some hospitals are beginning to not take Medicare. Now, our bill that I described to you a few minutes ago does not change Medicare. It's not that Medicare doesn't need changing, it's just that we thought, you know, if we get Obamacare changed, that's, that's enough in one bill. But at uh, Health Affairs, Tom Sabe and I, who was a former trustee of Medicare, uh, listed 10 reforms to Medicare, all of which we think would help seniors and make the system more viable. And one of the changes is what you're suggesting. Let's, let's free the patients and let them negotiate with doctors. And we don't have to do this for everybody at once. We can selectively do this. We also want to uh, free the concierge doctors. In fact, I don't see any reason why Medicare shouldn't pay a fourth or a half of the concierge fee because you get better care, you get more efficient care. Those doctors do talk on the phone, they do email. How many of you have a concierge doctor? You bet, the rest of you better start thinking about this <laughs> because I promise you it's going to get harder and harder and harder uh, as we ration by waiting. Oh, I, can't, I guess I can't call on people. You guys have to do this. Yeah. Hi, Doc. Hi. Um, are you familiar with Burt McComas's website, medicalselfsufficiency.com? No. No, okay. I, uh, he spoke at the uh, American uh, Association of Physicians and Surgeons, AAPS. Are you I know with them. Sure, yeah. sure I know them. The renegade doctors that want to eliminate third party payers from the doctor patient relationship. <laughs> Anyway, uh, this particular website educates people who don't want to buy third-party payer insurance of any kind and uh, gives them tips on how to be able to be a self-pay individual but do it in an affordable manner. And it might be something that people can check out and find out a little more about. But okay. Uh, I don't think we can get rid of third-party payer insurance uh, completely because some things are really expensive. and. Uh, $25,000 knee replacement or hip replacement, that's money most people don't have. 
Uh, but I do think we can empower the patient. Now, I'll tell you a quick story about WellPoint in California. They looked at all the, uh, the hospitals in the state, and their client is CalPERS, which are all the employees and their dependents of the state of California, so hundreds of thousands of people. And they discovered that for the hip and knee replacements, there were about 40 hospitals that consistently came in at below $30,000. And the others were all over the map, you know, from 15 to 100. And so what they said, uh, with the approval of the state of California uh, to their employees, if you go to one of these 46 hospitals, uh, we have the traditional deal. You can go out of network if you want to, but all we're going to pay is $30,000. So within a year, the average out of network charge fell by a third. Within two years, it was less than $30,000. So here are patients going into the market <laughs> telling the doctors and hospitals how much money they have to spend, all of a sudden the market is changing rapidly. And that's with WellPoint, not ever writing a letter, not ever picking the up the telephone, not negotiating with a single hospital, it's just letting markets work. Um, I understand that uh, before there were Obamacare mandates, there were mandates in many of the states, if not all of the states, that all of professional organizations lobbied for to get mandates for psychiatric care, um, podiatrist care, uh, and all the rest. Um, if those mandates didn't exist, if Obamacare had not put any mandates on Obamacare afford in the Affordable Care Act, but if opened up a free market among 50 states and people were simply able to um, just get the insurance they felt they needed given their age and life and everything and their uh, needs. Would that, would that have worked? Um, as long as you uh, eliminate the mandates and as you say, give the patient the power to decide what they need. Well, all those state mandates are still there, by the way. Uh, and, and my state's one of the worst. I mean, we have like 52 separate mandates. Uh, the Obamacare mandates, the, the primary thing they do is force you to buy a whole package. If you don't buy it, they fine you. Um, and that package, by the way, is a package which is really good for hospitals, but not good, say, for the employees of this hotel. Because what it does is it says there's going to be no lifetime limit and no, uh, no annual limit. So let's say that the employees of this hotel, let's say basically they're young and they're healthy and they don't have a lot of cash. Uh, so they now have a plan with a $6,000 deductible. Uh, if they have a premature baby and that baby costs a million dollars, the hospital is going to get its million. <laughs> but they don't have the 6000 for the deductible. They couldn't have paid the million anyway. So who, who was helped by that? The hospital. And so what we have in our bill is a more limited kind of insurance that people can choose for lower income families, no mandates. Um, and um, it works like this. For the first $50,000 or, say, $100,000, the employee's assets and income are protected uh, up to the limit of the plan. So the hospital, so if there were a million-dollar premature baby, the hospital could not uh, seize the assets. and the, It would get $100,000, but it wouldn't, couldn't seize the assets or the income of, of, of the family. So, so we want people to be able to have insurance that fits their financial needs and their health care needs, not the hospital's needs. Let me just say one more thing. The hospital still has a problem. You know, how are we going to pay for these expensive things that occasionally happen? But the right solution is not to impose on employees of this hotel insurance that doesn't meet their needs. Uh, there seemed to be a, a trend over the years of doctors selling their practices and going to work for hospitals, which to me would seem to compromise their role as an advocate for a patient to an insurance company, because now they're in the middle of, of it. I'm just wondering if you have some comments and you see if that continuing or? Oh, it's horrible, and it's happening because Medicare pays two or three times as much for doctor services billed through a hospital than it does for the doctor on his own. So what's he doing? He's selling out to the hospital. What happens then? The hospital puts pressure on him to keep the hospital beds filled because, folks, this is what hospitals do. They fill their beds. <laughs> and if they're not filling their beds, they're not, they're not making money. So, so the whole system, uh, what you described as bad, is contributing to cost inflation. 
It's the opposite of the direction we should. We, we, we should let the market make these decisions, not artificial subsidies coming from government. Yeah. Uh, a, a quick comment and a quick question. Um, I see is the difficulty in getting the liberal left on board with a thing like this is that I don't think, and many don't, that Obamacare was about health care whatsoever. It was about redistributing wealth. But my comment is, do you have any data one way or another on the cost of, uh, let's say, a surgeon or, and, the, and their quality? No, and it's hard to get data on costs and quality, but, but in the medical tourism market, they tell you what their quality data are. The health uh, city down in Grand Cayman will tell you what its readmission rate is. It will tell you its infection rate, its mortality rate for the different kinds of surgeries, and it will tell you a package price. Um, that's what happens when we have real markets. Let me just make a comment about the left. Um, about a year ago, I spent a whole day at the AFLCIO building in Washington, and uh, I'd never been there before. Uh, now I know where all the union dues go. It's a really nice building. But um, we laid out our plan for these guys, and they were interested. I mean, they didn't take my photograph and put it up on the wall or anything, but nor did they kick us out on the street. And I think, um, I, I, I believe that business and labor who, and other people you might think of as on the left can come together on a sensible reform uh, if we have the right kind of leaders. Hi, I don't know if I missed the comment, but how do you intend to stop the people from going into the plan when they're sick and coming out of the plan when they're not, which just creates havoc for everybody um, on, in terms of rates? The same way that Medicare does it. Uh, if, if, if they don't sign up and stay signed up when they're eligible, they get financially penalized. And if we're talking about Medigap insurance, in most states, they can underwrite you, which means charge you a premium that reflects your real health condition. So, um, so we can do this without mandates. We do it with the seniors. Let's do it with everybody else. Well, we have time for one more question. Thank you. Um, question, regarding the, over here, question regarding the role of the states in this. Why can I buy why can I not buy insurance across state lines? And secondly, would medical tort reform lower costs? Well, you have to stop and think what it means to buy insurance across state lines. Each state has its own mandates, okay? And um, what to me, buying across state lines would mean is if I'm living in Texas, uh, insurers should be able to sell me a plan that abides by Georgia mandates instead of Texas mandates. And if, if we could do that everywhere, um, it'd probably lower premiums by about 10%. Um, but um, but you got to get the Texas legislators to agree to that. And the reason they're unlikely to agree to it is the reason we have so many mandates in Texas is because they, they gave in to all the special interests. Um, so it's a hard thing to, to get done. Uh, on tort reform, I'm a radical on tort reform. I want to get the, the lawyers out of this entirely. Um, and uh, so, so I don't like these, you know, cap benefits and this and that. I, 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 I want a system where when you go to the hospital, you and the hospital sign a contract, sort of like uh, the relationship you have with an employer under workers' compensation. And if there's a medical uh, adverse outcome, let's say you die, you get a certain number of dollars. You lose an arm, you get a certain you lose legs. So you know what's going to happen to you uh, financially if bad things happen. And this needs to be approved by the state legislature, uh, but it's a voluntary contract between you and the hospital. You don't like the amounts, you can double the premium and, and, and insure on your own for more. But what that does is it gives the hospital an economic incentive to reduce all uh, causes of adverse medical outcomes, not just what's called malpractice. What's called malpractice is only 25% of the bad things that happen. The other three-fourths 
or acts of God and, 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 uh, and other reasons. Uh, infections, for example. But what happens if the, if the only thing the hospital focuses on is malpractice, it'll order more tests, the doctors will, and when they order more tests, they run up the risk of other bad things happening. So, so in, we have a system with skewed incentives. If we don't reform it the right way, we'll just create more perverse incentives. And what I want to do is get all the incentives right and get this out of the courthouse. Uh, and um, let, let, let economic incentives solve our safety problem. The, the hospital I mentioned down in Grand Cayman, um, they give you a package price. If there's an infection, if there's a readmission, they pay, you don't pay. And their readmission rates are low, and their infection rates are low, because it's in their economic self-interest to have them low. That's the answer to the malpractice problem. Thank you all very much.